are here to talk electric cars today. And these are the things we're going to talk about. Maybe a hundred years ago, our over the road transportation was transitioning from animal power, horses and mules, to mechanical power. Americans were already familiar with steam powered locomotives and farm equipment. So in those early days, the first and most popular cars were powered by steam. Electric cars were the second most popular and ladies particularly loved them because they were simple and easy to start. Gasoline powered cars were a distant third in the early years because they were complicated, unreliable and had to be hand cranked. But then along came Henry Ford who put electric starters in his Model Ts and we've been driving mostly gas engine cars ever since. But after about a hundred years of refining the gasoline engine, its dominance is fading now. Ready or not, electric cars are coming. Californians particularly like electric cars. Sales have doubled here in the past two years and 16% of all cars sold in California last year were electric. In California, the top selling car models are number four, Toyota Camry, number three, Toyota RAV4, number two, Tesla Model 3, number one, Tesla Model Y. So things are changing. Even for me, when I was a young man, I was a car guy. And then other priorities came along like family and work and I traded in my Porsche for a minivan. But driving my electric car is such a pleasure that I've become a car guy all over again. Driving's fun. The car is smooth and quiet. The electric motors don't make noise like an engine, so it's quiet inside as well. And electric motors are amazingly efficient and powerful. So does anybody recognize this car? Yeah, it's a Shelby Cobra. The Cobra was introduced with a small block V8 and its acceleration was considered just amazing. And then when that V8 was enlarged to 427 cubic inches, it could do zero to 60 miles an hour in under five seconds, five seconds. Now, fast forward to the present, and modern electric motors have more torque than V8 engines do. And my plain stock electric SUV can do zero to 60 miles an hour in under five seconds, like a 427 Cobra. And other electric cars accelerate even faster. Of course, we rarely need this much performance in day-to-day -day driving, but the torque is helpful when you need to accelerate into that open spot in traffic. And electric cars don't need a transmission, so there's no shifting up and down, just smooth acceleration. Regenerative braking, it's a key feature of all electric cars. It might more accurately be described as regenerative deceleration because the brakes aren't necessarily involved. As you accelerate the car, energy stored in the battery moves the car, but then as you decelerate, energy stored in the car's momentum goes back into the battery. This also happens when you go downhill. So when you're coming back from Lake 
Tahoe, your car's range actually increases as you're driving. Most electric cars allow you to adjust the degree of regenerative braking so that when you ease off the accelerator pedal, the car can either coast like a gas engine car or it can slow as though you were applying the brakes. I really like the ability to slow the car by just easing off the accelerator pedal. You only need to use the brake when there's an emergency. And while driving winding roads in the mountains, you don't even need to lift your foot off the accelerator and tap the brake. You just feather the throttle a little bit. With regenerative braking, I only use the brake pedal about once or twice a day. I use the brakes so rarely on my car that I expect those to last the life of the car. So let's talk range. According to Consumer Reports, the top three barriers to owning an electric car are range anxiety, charge logistics, and cost. So let's look at the range first. A few years ago, range was rather limited for electric cars, but today there are many electric cars with a range of over 300 miles, including cars made by Hyundai, Kia, Ford, BMW, Tesla, and some other high-end cars, uh, electric cars, have a range of over 400 miles. Now, there are still fewer charging stations and gas stations. So going on a long trip does require a little planning, but I just did a 600 mile round trip to Southern California with no problem at all. I stopped every couple of hours for lunch or a bathroom break. And the car's navigation system or an app in your phone like PlugShare will tell you where the charging stations are along your route. But in the US, 95% of our trips are under 30 miles. So range anxiety is more of a psychological barrier than a mathematical one. And I'll share two different views of range anxiety. First, my dentist. Now, he would love to have a Tesla Model S. Its range is over 400 miles. You'd think that was plenty, but no electric car will ever have enough range for his wife. Her range anxiety has simply overcome her. Here's another example. Because of range anxiety, some people have a second gas powered car on hand just in case. And I have a friend in Vermont who a few years ago bought a Tesla Model 3 but his wife kept her Subaru just in case. Now these folks take trips of about 300 miles almost every week. They're big Yankees fans and they drive from New York, uh, from Vermont down to New York for Yankees games. But they almost go, always go in the electric car. And after a year or two of that experience, his wife got over that range anxiety and replace that Subaru with another Model 3. So let's talk about charging. The first year I owned my electric car, I charged it with plain old 110 volt AC, just like you charge your phone. This is called level one charging. 110 volt charging adds energy to the battery at about four miles per hour of charging, which is adequate for that 30 miles a day that I mentioned. But 240 volt charging is much faster. So after a year, I wired up a 240 volt charging station in my garage. You can actually charge your car from your 240 volt dryer receptacle, but the charging station is handier. And this 240 volt charging is called level two. At home, I just plug the car in during the day 
And when the lowest off-peak rate comes into effect at midnight, the car starts charging. And in the morning, it's charged and ready. And 99% of the time, that's how I charge the car. But on the road, I use the fast DC charging and a stop for charging takes 15 to 25 minutes. It's a little more expensive. Uh, and this is called level three charging. So how long will that battery last? The batteries in early electric cars had to be replaced after a few years. But today's electric cars have much better battery management systems and batteries. And the batteries are turning out to last hundreds of thousands of miles. In California, for example, the warranties on batteries are required to be at least 10 years or 150,000 miles. But you can expect the battery to last longer than that. In practice, the batteries in electric cars are lasting far longer than whole gas engine cars. High mileage fleets like uh, taxis and airport limos are seeing their batteries last a half a million miles. But what happens with that, to that big battery when it eventually does give out? Well, recycled car batteries follow two general strings. The individual cells in that big battery are kind of like flashlight batteries. And even when the battery has reached end of life, many of these cells are still strong and chargeable. And these cells get repurposed into industrial applications. The cells that are no longer chargeable get their component metals and minerals recycled into altogether new cells. Currently, there are five facilities in the US that are dedicated to recycling electric car batteries. Uh, all electric cars have only been around for about 10 years, but hybrid cars like the Prius have been around for over 20. So most of the car batteries being recycled today are from hybrids and wrecked cars. But in 2022, more all electric cars were sold than hybrids so that balance is gradually changing. So what about electric cars impact on the environment? The manufacturing processes for electric cars do have higher greenhouse gas emissions. So you'll notice that the green line for electric cars starts out higher than the gold line for internal combustion engine cars. But after about two years on the road, an electric car's total emissions are far below any car with an internal combustion engine. And those savings continue for decades. You'll also notice that the electric car's green line is longer because electric cars last much longer. Much of the electric car's lower environ impact, environmental impact is due to laws of physics. A gas engine car uses less than 30% of its energy to power the wheels. The rest of that energy goes to heat and friction losses. Whereas electric cars use over 77% of their energy to power the wheels. Since the 1970s, we've been used to seeing fuel efficiency ratings in miles per gallon on window stickers of cars. So electric vehicle stickers show their miles per gallon equivalent because we're used to that. And by the way, the electric car with the worst efficiency is the Porsche Taycan. Turbo S at 68 
miles per gallon equivalent. Still not bad. The car with the best EPA rating is the Tesla Model 3 Standard Range Plus at 142 miles per gallon equivalent. But what if that electricity on the grid that the car is using is generated by burning really dirty fuel? Well, coal is the dirtiest source and no state actually generates all of its electricity with coal. But even if the grid was powered entirely by coal, electric cars would still have fewer emissions than the average new compact gasoline engine vehicle. So let's talk about that uh, power grid. Americans consume about 20% more electricity during the day than we do at night understandably. So during the day, the electricity, electric utilities fire up their natural gas powered peaking plants, and then they shut them down at night. But most electric vehicle owners like me charge during the night, during off peak hours. So that helps spread the load on the grid. In California today, electric vehicles account for only 0.4% of the load on the grid. But by 2035, the California, Electric, the California Energy Commission projects that load to increase to 4%. So the grid operators actually don't need to add a lot of new capacity. Uh, they think that it's gonna work out really well. For those of you in California, do you remember how hot it was last August 17th and how Pacific Gas and Electric was warning about possible rolling blackouts? During that event, a virtual power plant helped out by pumping power into the grid. So what is a virtual power plant? It's three thousand California homeowners who signed up to share stored electricity with PG&E in case of a heat event like this. Those homeowners have Tesla Powerwall batteries in their homes. And on August 17th, about 2,300 of them actually shared their power with PG&E reaching a peak flow of 16 megawatts. And then PG&E reimbursed these homeowners 30 to $40 for borrowing their electrons that day. Now, imagine that instead of a few thousand power wall owners loaning their power to the grid, what if there were a few million electric car owners loaning their power. Well, PG&E is already prototyping bi-directional vehicle charging through electric vehicle supply equipment. And by 2030, they plan to have 2 million electric vehicles participating in the vehicle to grid program. And they say that by 2035, such electric vehicles that are have uh, EBSE connections could power all the homes in California for three days. So I think the grid's going to be in pretty good shape with uh, the addition of electric cars. Back when I was a car guy the first time, I enjoyed working on my car. I changed its oil and filter, adjusted the valves, replaced the belts and the ignition wire, flushed the radiator, changed the transmission fluid, adjusted the timing, got the spark plugs. I love that stuff. But eventually I started having that work done by a repair shop, which costs maybe a hundred bucks an hour plus parts. 
And electric cars are just much simpler. You don't need this kind of maintenance. If electric motors are lasting almost a million miles, well, eventually you do have to replace tires and windshield wipers, but that's about it. Speaking of tires, the electric cars are very quiet. So the main noise that you hear is the road noise, the tires against the road. So typically the tires for electric cars are filled with foam to reduce that noise. Okay, Bogleheads, let's talk dollars. So currently the average price of a new car is about 48 grand average new car price, about 64,000. The variety of electric vehicles has improved dramatically, even in the last year alone. And that's gonna continue to improve over time. But those electric cars do cost more, but even this year, just the first month of this year, you've seen price drops in electric cars that differential between the gas engine cars and electric cars is disappearing. And by, uh, by 2026, three years out, I expect there to be parity on uh, sedans and another two years later, probably parity in SUVs. But there are still a lot of inexpensive uh, electric cars. A friend of mine, purchased a uh, Chevy Bolt uh, about a month ago for 26,000. So it's, um, there are affordable electric cars and there are luxury electric cars. I mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act of 22 earlier, uh, that took effect in January. And the first thing to know about it is that its abbreviation is IRA, but it has nothing to do with individual retirement accounts. It's all about plug-in electric vehicles assembled in the US and purchased this year. Second thing to know about this one is that it is a tax credit. And in order to use it, your federal tax liability must be at least as much as the credit you get. The third thing to know is it's complicated. And part of that complication is determining how much of the car's battery minerals and components are generated domestically. So in, in because of this complication back in December, Pardon me. The IRS said it, it would have some guidance on the sourcing and battery materials sometime in March, and they'd make a determination about which cars were eligible in March. Well, the good news is that until March, all qualifying vehicles in their list are eligible for the full $7,500 credit. Now, at some point, presumably March, they're probably gonna knock some out of the list because they consider the components aren't sufficiently domestic. But in any case, they have already got a list of qualified vehicles on the web and it changes periodically. It was just updated about a week ago when they added the Cadillac Lyric, Ford Mustang Mach-E and Tesla Model Y to the qualified vehicles, in this case, SUVs. And I, because the, the IRS's link is so very long to get to that list, I created a little bitly uh, shortcut to it. So if you wanna to get to that list to find out whether your favorite electric car is eligible for the tax credit, just go to bit.ly slash qualified vehicles. And you might wanna check that list now because it, your, your favorite car just might 
fall off that list uh, in March when the IRS finally gets it together. So let's, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing and let's take some more questions and learn what we can. Thank you.